the bright red ripe harvest of tomatoes is the most fantastic leaving present from summer. And if you haven't yet eaten a tomato, warm off the plant, well, that's a pleasure that you've yet to discover. The late summer in our garden is a time to play and reap the harvest that we've worked for. Well, at least for some of the household, anyway. But harvest is, in truth, always a busy time. We produce a deliberate glut of tomatoes, because as well as eating them fresh off the vine, we make large quantities of rich tomato sauce for the freezer, which is the best way to preserve that essential tomato in all its summer glory. These are huge, isn't it? I think that is the biggest tomato I've ever grown. It's a good idea to grow a selection of varieties to get a range of sizes, flavours and textures. Cooking them really simply is essential to capture the taste and unique scent that freshly picked tomatoes have. One of the best ways to deal with tomatoes is to roast them. So I'm just cutting them all in half first, just picking them over to make sure there are no nasty bits of that. And then just put a bit of olive oil in the pan. And then put the tomatoes soft side down. And really cram them in, because as they roast, they'll shrink a bit. And even watery tomatoes taste fantastic cooked like this. It really brings out the flavor. All you need to do now is add two or three cloves of garlic, just cut into slivers, a sprinkling of salt, and because you want a nice, rich, garlicky mixture, maybe a little bit more oil. OK, and just to finish it off, just put a few sprigs of thyme over the surface, and it's a really good combination with tomatoes. Roast them in a hot oven for about 45 minutes, and that's it. Very simple, but very delicious. Tomatoes are one of the staples of our diet, and we eat tons of them. We'll be harvesting these fruits from July until well into October. And whether you have a greenhouse or not, they are dead easy to grow organically. The genesis of this harvest began last spring on a cold March morning. The seeds were sown thinly in a peat-free organic compost. It's a good idea to cover them with a layer of vermiculite, which is a very lightweight mineral, and it doesn't form a crust like compost can, making it easier for the delicate seedlings to emerge. Labelling is tedious but essential, otherwise you invariably forget which variety is in which seed tray. Put the trays somewhere with constant warmth. A greenhouse is ideal, but a windowsill is perfectly good. Water them lightly, and they should germinate about a week later. As soon as the seedlings are big enough to handle, about two weeks after germinating, they should be pricked out into their own pots to give them more room to grow strongly. Now this tomato is not ready for pricking out because these are not two true leaves, these are the seed leaves, and it needs to develop leaves that show there are roots. Now here you can see there are two leaves growing nicely and as soon as those two leaves appear it's time to prick it out because there'll be a root system to support it. Hold it by the leaf, get a knife or something underneath it and just gently lift it up and it's, don't hold it by the stem and just pop it into a pot like that, put some soil around it and the whole thing has got to be quite gentle. Don't worry if it flops, it'll sort itself out and that's that one. Grow the seedlings on in a light, warm place for another month or so, keeping them well watered, which in practice means never letting them dry out. By the middle of May, it's time to plant the tomatoes out into the unheated greenhouse. Tomatoes like a rich soil, so I dig in plenty of mushroom compost about a month ahead of planting out. 
place them at least a couple of feet apart to give the roots room to develop and support the fully grown plant. Tomatoes also grow well in grow bags or any container really, as long as they get plenty of sun. But however you do grow them, by mid-June the tomato plants will be growing strongly and will need some attention. When you grow tomatoes in a greenhouse, the only practical way to do it is to grow them as a cordon, which means training the stem up some sort of support. Now, tomatoes don't really want to do that. They want to bush out and, and flop all over the place. So you have to tie them and also pinch out the side shoots. Now, I don't know if you can see here, but that doesn't mean taking off the leaves. There's a leaf, which it needs, obviously, to feed it and to grow. And here's the main stem. But this one here... This one is trying to sneak up and it will grow really big and strong so we just nip it out. As the long, hot days of high summer unfold, the tomatoes grow with amazing vigour. But too much growth will mean too few ripe fruit. I'm cutting the tops off because these want to keep on growing upwards and producing more fruit. And I think we've got as many as we can reasonably ripen in time. So by cutting the tops off, they'll stop growing up and put all the energy into the fruit that's here. And start removing leaves at the base of the plant to improve ventilation, as well as any that are blocking the sun. When you grow tomatoes organically, as with all organic gardening, what you're after are robust plants that can resist attack from pests and disease. Now, we don't use any artificial fertilizers, but there are natural ones, like seaweed. Seaweed concentrate, diluted with water, gives the tomatoes a dose of essential nutrients, and it's worth applying it every few weeks to the leaves and the soil. You can also deter pests without resorting to chemicals. We plant basil at the foot of the tomatoes in midsummer. Now, both plants share the same like for rich soil and water, but more than that, the basil smell helps keep the aphids away. But ultimately, nature will always look after itself. We leave the poppies where they crop up, as long as they're not in the way of something else we want to grow, because apart from the fact that they look nice, and I like the sort of chaotic appearance of them, but also they attract predator insects like hoverflies which then feed off the aphids which attack our crops and the whole organic thing is letting anything that isn't actively harming you stay and it's part of the cycle and you know the more I garden and the more I grow things the less bothered I am by any one particular predator it's never the end of the world if it takes some stuff there's usually more than enough to spare now, that said, if aphids persist and you just can't tolerate them, an organically acceptable solution is to spray the plants with diluted soft soap, like washing up liquid. This kills the flies, but doesn't harm the plants, and perhaps most importantly, doesn't affect the taste. Tomatoes grown outdoors are about a month behind their indoor cousins. However, they taste just as good. And the growing procedure is exactly the same as for indoor plants. So, prick out and then grow the plants on in warm conditions. But, seedlings raised indoors are in a very sheltered environment, so it's really important to harden them off for a couple of weeks before planting them out into the big bad world. A cold frame is ideal, but a sheltered wall would do fine although you might have to bring them indoors at night for the first few days if it gets cold. Plant the hardened off tomatoes into a sunny spot with soil that has plenty of organic matter dug into it and treat them just like indoor plants. Water them, tie them to a stake, give them some seaweed feed and then leave them to it. Of all the things we grow, this is the major harvest. A mass of tomatoes already feels like the summer's achievement. Don't worry if all your tomatoes ripen at once and you have an excess, because a great way of storing any type of tomato is as a sauce. Roughly chop them and then fry them in olive oil. And you add a bit of salt. And to bring out the tomato taste, you want to add just a touch of sugar. About a teaspoonful, but as with all the other things, it doesn't matter terribly how much, just a little bit. And we freeze this simply as the basis for a sauce. 
And then when we come to use it, we can add garlic or onions or herbs or whatever. And it's very versatile. You can use it for soups, sauces with pasta, or for pizza. But I do add a little bit of thyme at this stage, because if we use this in the winter, we won't have any fresh thyme. And then we'll add whatever fresh herbs we have. Got to be careful not to put the twiggy bits in. My children always say that when I make sauce, we have to take the sticks out. Okay, I'll leave that to reduce for about 20 minutes and then we'll freeze it. And in that frozen block will be all that essential summer tomatoiness. The roast tomatoes are great with lamb and chicken, although actually I love them just on their own, mopped up with a good hunk of bread. Tomatoes are a doddle to grow. You can do it any old how, outside, in a grow bag, in a pot, on a windowsill, on a roof, in a greenhouse, you can hardly go wrong. Of course, you have to tend them. You have to make sure they're tied up and all that sort of thing, but they're really simple. And what variety you choose tends to be a matter of taste. There are certain characteristics that you can look for. So if you've got a beef tomato like this, this is burpy delicious. I also grow marmande. You're looking for something with a dense flesh that is great to slice up, but you can cook with it too. These are Shirley. Goodly good for organic gardening too, because they're very robust and resistant. Very nice raw, you make very good soup. They're a very good general purpose fruit. If you grow a cherry tomato, like this Gardener's Delight, they're normally eaten whole and raw, and they're very sweet and delicious. Gardener's Delight tend to be on the large size for cherries, and, and one of the best. And also, I think, make the best sauce there is. Ideal, really thick, creamy sauce, wonderful for pizza. And when you taste your own tomatoes, that's when every moment spent growing them is worthwhile. Now the whole point of growing food in the garden is to get the really best ingredients you can and then do as little as possible to turn them into delicious food. And with onions, all you have to do is stick them in an oven-proof bowl Stick the bowl in the oven, leave it there for about an hour in quite a hot heat, go away and do something else. Come back, take them out of the oven, and they're delicious. We tend to treat onions as the chorus line, not the main performers, but it's astonishing how velvety rich they can be. So Isn't that sweet. fantastic? Yeah. Isn't that amazing? It's such a surprise. We eat outside whenever we can, but this onion dish is also perfect for a cold winter's night. Come on, come, come, come on. Action. Come. 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 In the depth of winter, the garden lurks and sulks outside like a spotty catwalk modeling curlers. But even at its least appealing, there's always the promise of spring to come. And I find that inspecting the sullen garden by torchlight last thing at night hides the depressing bigger picture, whilst revealing just enough to inspire and fire me up to prepare for the new gardening year. Pumpkins, That's the cucumbers. Chicory, is it? Growing any food needs planning, and winter is the time to order seeds, naturally organic ones if you can. When the seeds have arrived, we ceremoniously lay them out on the kitchen table, where they will return as meals later in the year. This might seem a bit of bureaucracy, but it's a lot better than working out in the cold and wet. When we get the seeds laid out on the kitchen table like this, we can see exactly what we've got and also what we haven't got, which can be as important. We lay them out in groups so you have spinach there, and the peas there, and the cabbage there, and what have you. And then we've got to think, well, where are we going to grow everything? Because every single packet, whatever it is, needs a patch of ground. But because they don't all harvest at the same time, packets can share the same patch of ground, and you get succession. As one thing finishes, you clear it, and you put in something else. So the whole year starts to get mapped out physically on this table. Not necessarily literally, but it's a real aid to working out what you're going to do outside. Just to make things more complicated, if that wasn't enough, we have to think about rotation, because it's unhealthy to grow the same crops in the same place each year. And it can seem a little complicated or daunting, but actually I love it. It's part of the fun of the whole business. Okay. Oh, it's a different type of R&D. 
But before you can sew anything outside, you must first do some basic groundwork. It's important to prepare the soil as soon as you can. It's almost part of food preparation because the better the soil, without any question, the better the food that will end up on your plate. Digging, to me, is the, the essential act of gardening. It's really important to break up this subsoil because after all that's what these delicate little feeding roots are going to have to push through and by getting air into it also you'll be able to get more water into it and they can feed better. Adding organic matter such as garden compost at this stage does wonders for your soil structure. And there might be a temptation for people to do this and rake it off and then think I've got to plant into it but that would be a mistake. This should be left now for at least a week and wouldn't hurt to be left for a month. When you do have some ground ready, onion sets and garlic are two hardy crops that can stand being planted out in the middle of winter. Plant large, healthy garlic cloves because the quality of the garlic you use will affect how good your summer harvest is. We planted several varieties this year, Printlanon, Elephant and Sprint. Great names. Use your finger to make a hole in the soil, pop the clothes in, pointed end upwards, about eight inches apart. For shallots or onion sets, make a shallow indentation in the soil and gently place the sets, or bulbs, at least six inches apart. The garlic and shallots will multiply and the onions swell up over the long growing season. And choose a sunny part of the garden, because all kinds of onions like that. We also grow onions from seed indoors in February. It's a cheaper option and there's a bigger selection of varieties. Sow them thinly and add a layer of vermiculite before watering. In early spring, when the soil is warmed up in your part of the world, transplant each onion plant individually. Put them about six inches apart, and each one will form an onion bulb. Just because onions and garlic are so easy to grow organically, it doesn't in any way lessen the sense of personal satisfaction as those tubular leaves start to appear. There is one thing you need to watch. They're very effective by competition for nutrients and water from weeds, so keep on top of them. By midsummer, your garlic and first onions will be ready to harvest. I'm just lifting these shallot roots out the ground. They've grown as much as they're going to grow, so anything they do now is just going to make them flower, which we don't want. And all we do is just let tease them out. They're hardly in the ground, and leave them to dry in this lovely warm weather. They'll dry out, which means they'll store better. Harvesting garlic takes a bit more effort. Dig them out of the soil and the leaves start to turn yellow and dry out. By growing your own, you get to experience the more delicate flavour of fresh garlic and onions, and also you'll appreciate just what a lovely object a humble onion is. The onions tend to be ready a bit later than the shallots, and just like them, you need to pull them up and let them dry. Well, the great thing about an onion is, is that they're so beautiful. Look at that. Shiny like a conker. You can't get that if you buy it because the skin dries off. Of course, it's great for storing, but it just doesn't look so good. I wouldn't miss that for the world. Look at that. Onions and garlic need a bit of tweaking before you store them. You have to rub off any loose skin or any soil. Then they'll store for months in a cool, dark, airy place. It stops them rotting or sprouting. A garret or a shed will be fine. Our supply sees us through winter and is a basic component of many meals. One great favourite is pizza, based simply on our own onions and tomatoes. Right, to make our pizzas, we need two pounds of strong flour. I'm a messy cook, I spill everything everywhere. 
Then you need about a pint of warm water. So four teaspoons of dried yeast. It works extremely well. Spoonful of sugar to activate it. Just keep stirring till it dissolves. Now just make a well in the middle of the flour. Everything just gets mixed all together. Now this is four tablespoons of olive oil straight in to Three, four. Just a pinch of salt. Now, I mix that by hand to a dough. Now, this is sort of slightly slapdash, but it works really well. And I'm always in a hurry when I cook these, so just get it done as fast as possible because you have to be organised. It needs to be done a couple of hours in advance of cooking, just to allow it to rise. You need for about, well, anything up to ten minutes till it's a nice firm dough. And everyone thinks of pizzas as being junk food, but actually it's perfectly healthy. It's organic flour, organic oil, vegetables from the garden. Montague makes much of a performance out of making his bread, but this is, I do as quickly as I can. So I'll just get some flour. Now, that just needs kneading for a, a minute or two. It's already pretty pliable and flexible. It's lovely, it's slightly warm. So I think that's nearly ready now. Doesn't need much more. So, what we do now is put it in a clean bowl. It's been oiled so it doesn't stick to the surface. Okay, so that's ready. So I just put it in a warm place to rise and just cover it with a cloth. Partly to stop it drying out and also because it is a bit of a dusty kitchen. It stops, who knows what, dropping into it. We all choose our own toppings for the pizza, which is the best way to avoid any squabbles. But there is one golden rule. The best pizzas are very simple. Tomato sauce, some onions fried gently in oil, and then whatever you fancy. Mozzarella, perhaps some peppery salami, and certainly fresh herbs from the garden. Basil, thyme, marjoram. So your pizzas look as good as they taste. You're done. Pizzas take about 10 minutes in a really hot oven for the dough to get the right crispness. This is fast food with a difference. Simple, DIY, and everybody loves it.